Hey everyone, it's Harms from Harms Story Books, and today I'd like to talk to you about something that is coming to my attention. This video is all about accessing LGBTQ plus books and the issues that I have with accessing them and the overall implications of that lack of access. So my process for creating a video is pretty simple. I stick all my ideas in a Word document with tags, I find the books, I read them, then I do the video. Sounds fairly straightforward. Often I have the idea for a video, write down the list of books that I need for it, and then I'm stuck on the second step. I can't find the books, or at the very least, they are difficult to access. Often I have to order my books from different libraries across the state and other times across the country, or I have to send an email to collections librarians to see if they can source the book, or I have to call independent bookshops and speak to a particular staff member who specializes in finding rare books, quote unquote. I search used book websites, I ask my friends, I ask the queer community, and more often than not, someone comes through. I owe so much to my community and my friends who allow me to borrow very special books so that I can read them and review them for this channel. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to the collection staff at my library, for their tireless work sourcing queer books for me, you are all gems and I don't know how you do it. I am grateful to independent bookshop book staff who haggle with some person overseas on the phone so that I can have a book at a reasonable price, shipping notwithstanding. And then there's usually a wait time, at least four weeks, but usually six to eight weeks. This is fine, I can wait, I'm a patient person. I usually try to plan more other accessible books to come in around the same time so that I can film them in a batch, read them, return them, and then they can start the long track back to their respective bookshelves. There are certainly times where I've anticipated this difficulty in sourcing books. I wanted to do a video about lesbian pulp fiction novels from the 50s and 60s, but as you can imagine, it's difficult to find copies of these books for reasonable price or in reasonable condition. I've looked through a couple of the more popular ones, or ones that have been republished. Books like Women's Barracks by Teresca Torres, The Girls in 3B by Valerie Taylor, Odd Girl Out by Anne Bannon have all been republished or are available as ebook. Otherwise, anthologies like Strange Sisters, The Art of Lesbian Pulp Fiction 1949-1969 by Jay Zimmett, or Lesbian Pulp Fiction, The Sexually Intrepid World of Lesbian Paperback Novels 1950-1965, a collection of chapters of different lesbian pulp novels can help me on my search. This book is a difficult book to source in itself. There are lots of articles that talk to that era, but again, sourcing these books takes time, patience and effort and money. All of that I anticipated. It makes sense to wait some time for older books or books that are out of print. What I didn't anticipate was how often this would happen to me. It happened to me with What I Love About Being Queer by Vivek Shreya, a collection of essays and stories about different queer people and trans people in Canada, published in 2013. I didn't anticipate it would happen with Queer by Robert Kirby, an anthology and history of queer comics published in 2014. Granted, it was part of a Kickstarter campaign, but that doesn't mean it should fetch these prices for used editions on Amazon.ca or these prices from Amazon.com. I first tried looking for it through the Alberta Library website and found nothing, so once again I contacted the collections librarians of my library who said there may be six possible copies in six different Canadian libraries that they would try and said that it would take six to eight weeks to get to me. For the most part, the books that I have trouble with are published in the 2000s or 2010s, Often the author is from a Commonwealth country like the UK, Australia or Canada. Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg, first published in 1993 then reissued in 2003, is long considered a classic in the LGBTQ community and is not available through my library so I have to ask another library to borrow it. Often I find a new queer or trans author that I love through reading a library book. So I look up their backlist, go through the library catalogue, and hold my breath. After reading Tomboy Survival Guide by Ivan Coyote, a book long listed for the Canada Reads Prize in 2018, I looked through their back catalogue. My library, thankfully, had many of their books, but some of them only in ebook, which is not a format I like to read. 
these books again are published in 2012, 2007, 2002, 2005, published by Arsenal Pulp Press, which is one of my favorite publishing houses in Vancouver, one state over from where I live. And so on and on it goes. And I, a library assistant working in a library in the capital of my state, with all of my community resources, connections, and friends, can't find a copy of the book I'd like to read. That begs the question, what's the point in recommending the fucking book if no one else can find it? That would make the whole, I recommend you read this book, kind of pointless. Talking about rare books is of course important, but if no one else can access the books I recommend, then why recommend them at all? Because they're important, because they reflect my history, my culture, collective knowledge, because the language I use to describe myself comes from them, because the rights I have, I have because of them. It reminds me of an Instagram account, LGBT History, run by Matthew Raymer and Leighton Brown, who went to an event commemorating Frank Kamney, who was a queer rights activist, who I just had to Google because I didn't know who he was. If you'd like to know, Kamney was dismissed from the U.S. Army Map Service in Washington in the 1960s for his orientation, which spearheaded many court cases, many of which he lost, but he's an activist nonetheless. The same thing happened to Leighton and Matthew. They realized they didn't know enough about their own history, and being kept in ignorance is a method of oppression, and so they started this Instagram account, which is now a book, and I am endlessly thankful for their work, their efforts, and their voices. Recently, I decided to do the non-binary book tag, started by some non-binary booktubers. I'm still working on that video, but to my surprise, I found quite a few books that fit the first question. Name a book that features an NB character. One of them is Two Strand River by Keith Maylard, a book I had to request through the Alberta Library System, first published in 1976. It apparently is one of the first published books to feature a non-binary character, but non-binary people have existed since before 19 1976. Non-binary people have existed for as long as people have existed, but what names did they use before the word non-binary came into being? I'm thankful for that non-binary book tag, as it has me asking questions I didn't ask before. And now I know about Two Strand River, a piece of history of culture that I didn't know about before. As many of you know, or some of you may not know, I borrow a lot of my books from the library and then only purchase my favorites. So what I buy is, I think, always the best of the best. Attention from my personal library, and this is something that my wife will probably hear for the first time in this video, is that I want it to be a reflection of queer culture and all its vibrancy, all its layers, all its uniqueness. I want a clamoring of voices, a shelf full of rare books, paperback books, old books, new books. I want to find all the books that were published in the mid-2010s and give them a damn home before they disappear to library book sales, basements, and charity shops around the world before they're damaged by water or by bed bugs or by some other type of fungus that can eat paper, before they're burned in an accidental fire or burned because they were challenged and taken from a library's collection. Is it so bad that I want them at my fingertips? A question I have to ask when they seem so hard to find. But all of this work, calling different libraries, independent bookshops, scouring the internet, all of the waiting, the endless searching, all of those restless questions, it's worth it. It will always be worth it. Thank you for watching everyone.